Welcome back to Act 3 of Summons Only. If you have not seen the other acts, then I would highly recommend checking them out before watching this. With that being said, let's get right into it. As per usual, the first to stand in our way are the Gith. And since none of my summons follow me through the night, I am forced to just run past them. The fake long rest does not actually refresh any of our items either, so we are significantly weaker than we normally would be for the battle to come. Still, this fight is not that bad. All the gifts can be affected by whole person, and thus I just have to keep spamming it each turn. And since all the gifts just go straight for me, our summons, despite their small numbers, are able to slowly whittle them down one by one. With the Enhanced Parasite, we now gain two very powerful abilities. The first one is Mind Sanctuary, creating an area for three turns in which all of our summons will be hasted. It has to be placed with care though, as anyone moving out of it loses all movement speed for the rest of their turn. The other ability is a transformation called Displacer Beast. It works like any druid transformation, granting us an extra 84 hit points, and has an action called Illusory Copy. This ability lets us summon a copy of ourselves that attacks anyone which enters its radius. We also get a bonus action called Displace. It works by teleporting ourselves and another target, leaving behind a copy. Normally this would deal damage to the targets, meaning that I'm not allowed to use it on enemies, but we can use it on our own copies, letting us spawn up to two each turn. And while their damage isn't the highest, and they only last three turns, the fact that each one can tank a full 85 damage, and we can create two per turn, is a very substantial upgrade. I bought the Cloak of Displacement for a bit of extra dodge, and moved on to the lower city. First stop here is Mystic Carrion. To get there, I headed straight down into the harbor and killed a few fish people that attacked. This gave me level 10. Leveling Druid any further won't do anything for us, and soon enough we will want a full respec anyways. So for now, I just put the one level into Wizard. By taking the back way into Carrion's mansion, we can skip all the other steps and immediately confront him. He sells arguably the most powerful item in this entire run for us, Armor of the Spore Keeper. While we have the temporary hit points from Symbiotic Entity, it lets us spread Bitter Bang Spores, not usable since they deal damage, Timask Spores, also not usable since they also do damage, but most importantly, Haste Spores. Just like Mind Sanctuary, anything that enters the spores over the three rounds it's there will get hasted. Unlike the Mind Sanctuary, there is no movement restrictment after leaving. So effectively, it just doubles all our damage. Aside from selling us the armor, Carrion also wants help finding his lost servant, which can be done just up the road in this little house. Of course, I have no real reason to help Carrion and decide to betray him and help Thrombo instead, as he will reward us with the only real ring that does anything for us. In order to do Thrombo's questline, we need to kill Carrion, but if we were to just go and fight him straight on, we would be in big trouble, as he is basically just immortal. So to get around this, we will need to walk around the city and destroy all of his body parts. The first two can be found in the sewers, right next to the Undercity Ruins waypoint. I send in Connor to trigger the surprise encounter and use Shovel to surprise them and instead. This fight is quite annoying. Anytime we cast a spell of any level, it will do 3 to 18 necrotic damage per level to us. Not only limiting what I can do myself, but severely prohibiting my strongest damaging summon, the Cambion, from doing his thing. The only real way for me to get around this is to immediately go into my Displacer Beast form, as its abilities don't count as having any level. And after creating a whole bunch of clones, I managed to just barely outlast the mummies. And just behind this hidden door is Carrion's brain and limb. Ever. The third piece of carry-on can be found down in a cellar by the graveyard, and the last one is inside of Thrombo himself. With all the jars destroyed, it's time to take on carry-on. He has an ability that lets him take control of any undead we attack with, and although he is damageable now, he is still completely immune to all physical damage. Meaning that there is no point in attacking with most of our summons since they cannot harm him and he will just take control of them when they do. Thankfully, Carrion is a mummy, so he is very vulnerable to fire, and therefore by summoning the fire version of our elemental, and using the devastating fire attack from our Cambion, combined with the haste spores, I was able to kill him before he could get any moves in. With Carrion down, we are now free to attack its minions however we like, and it's only a matter of time before they also fall. Now for the reason we did this fight in the first place. Thrombo shows up and rewards us with the Crypt Lord's Ring. It lets us use a level 6 version of Create Undead to summon a mummy. 
It has 93 health all by itself, deals a good amount of damage, and if the target is frightened, can multi-attack for a massive 16 to 66 damage. It's time for the location that almost all my builds seem to need to visit, Sorcerer Sundries. Since this run has a serious lack of actual useful rings it can use, I decide to just replace the Ring of Exalted Marrow with the Ring of Regeneration from Roland, also making sure to buy a scroll of Conjure Elemental here. Time for the Lorokan fight. This time we will actually need to pay attention to the mechanics of this fight. Lorokan can counterattack anyone that hurts him with an attack that deals damage based on however many of his elementals are still alive. So going straight for him is just not doable. Worse than that though is the fact that all of my units spawn in the exact same location after entering, letting his elemental and himself take out most of them before they even get a turn. Since we can't straight up go for Lorokan and he has so many AoE attacks, our only real hope is to somehow distract him with Displacer Beasts. Dame gets in some good damage, and I do get to counterspell at least one of his AoE attacks. Big emphasis on one of them. Eventually Roland dies, and Lorokan gets surrounded enough to feel the need to use his AoE attacks on our Displacer Beasts. The Elementals manage to bring me out of my transformation, but it's already too late, as two of the Elementals are dead, and Lorokan basically is all out of spell slots. So after just a few more rounds, the last Elementals die, and I hold person Lorokan to finish this fight. I should probably have tried doing that a bit earlier. At the bottom of the tower, we collect Marco Heshkir, not for its offensive capabilities, but just for the fact that it's a free level 6 spell use. The real upgrades are not here though, but down in the vaults. Just next to the portal, there's a hidden room behind this chest with a book. Reading it gives us the scroll of Bestial Communion, and this scroll will be extremely important very shortly. Continuing on to the maze doors, I enter the Silver Hand door, followed by the Evocation door, and finally the Wish door. On the other side of this door is a lever, pulling it opens Elminister's door, and inside of it we find the Tharkiet Codex. It curses us, and after curing the curse, we will now, at the start of every long rest, get a free 20 temporary hit points, which is useless since we have Symbiotic Entity anyways. However, it also has another lesser known capability. By reading it, we can now finally interact with the Necromancy of Thay again, and after passing a DC 20 saving throw, we get the spell Dance Macabre, an extremely powerful spell that summons four ghouls to fight by our side. They are uncontrollable and sometimes the AI is a bit dumb, but it's still a massive upgrade. Due to them being ghouls, they are also immune to going mad from our demon spirited aura, and by putting six levels into necromancy, the Dance Macabre spell now raises five ghouls instead of just four. Now with six levels into wizard and the remaining going towards druid, I still needed access to level six spell slots in order to use the scroll we found, so I just walked around killing a few people until I reached level 11. Since we only have 6 levels in Wizard, we don't actually get access to Conjure Elemental or to Conjure Minor Elemental anymore, which is why we needed the scrolls. We can now also finally learn the Summon Diva scroll. It creates a Diva with 136 HP that can use Wrathful Smite every single attack. Sadly, it cannot coexist at the same time as our Cambion, so it's time to say goodbye to him. But at least this means that we can re-equip Falar Aluv. Also with the level 6 spell slots, Conjure Elemental can now be upcast to instead create a stronger Myrmidon. They are all very powerful, but the air one is my personal favorite. It gets an electric flail that can stun anyone it attacks for two whole turns. Finally, with level 6 spell slots, we can now upcast Animate Dead to level 6 and summon in another 4 flying ghouls, meaning that we now have 9 ghouls in total, each one having a chance of paralyzing any target they attack. This, combined with the Myrmidon, easily lets us permastun most of the encounters in the game. There is still one final item upgrade available for us, and it's inside Gortash's personal room. To get to it, I simply went in the back way and used invisibility to sneak past all the guards. Inside his personal chest, we find the Helldusk Boots. These let us, once per long rest, succeed any saving throw we would fail using our reaction. Very nice for keeping our concentration. Last thing to do now before taking on the final fights of the game is getting level 12. And what better way to do so than heading down under Worms Rock and collecting the free 5000 XP that is just waiting here. Heading over to rescue Volo, our new summons get to shine as they stun and paralyze everyone. 
With level 12 and thereby level 6 in Druid, we now get back the fungal infestation charges to resummon our 4 zombies. And now, finally have created our final lineup of summons. Using the level 6 spell Hero's Feast and an upcasted level 6 aid gives us an absolutely absurdly tanky team. In total, not even counting myself, they have 1622 health. Time for the Steelwatch Foundry. The first couple encounters on the way there stand no chance whatsoever. Remember, we can basically just stun anyone, and even if they were to get an attack off, they still need to deal over 1600 damage somehow. The Hellfire Titan himself cannot be surprised, but it can be both stunned and paralyzed. And so, after 6 attacks, I successfully managed to paralyze it. I cannot overstate just how overpowered it is to be able to paralyze or stun something for 2 turns. Paralyzing something doesn't only stun it, it also gives each attack towards the target a 100% chance to hit and guaranteed crit, letting me burst it down with the rest of my summons in a single turn. With the foundry down, it is time to take out Gortash. I of course start the fight with Shovel and get him to tank the brunt of Gortash's initial damage. Very timely, he decides to head over to this corner and using the Displacer Beast form, I am able to create a wall of summons, preventing anyone else from helping him. Gortash enters his second phase and does a whole bunch of nothing and unfortunately for him, he is not immune to the effects of paralysis either. At this point, the ghouls are just carrying this whole run. Anyways, with no point in killing the rest of his crew, I just take my leave and head over to Saravok. This time I thought that instead of fighting him, I could just become an unholy assassin. This way he just gives us the amulet without us needing to do anything, and we also get the bonus of killing the annoying elephant, so that's always something. With the amulet in hand, it is now time to take down Orin. I thought that this fight was going to be as easy as the other ones, as Orin only has 12 unstoppable charges and I had upwards to 50 attacks each turn. However, it turns out that she is harder to hit than expected. And even worse than that, the ritual that is ongoing does not just grant her unstoppable charges, but in honor mode, it will put a condition on us every turn that immediately kills us at the end of our turn unless we ourselves kill someone. But if we killed someone, the whole point of this run would be ruined, so somehow I needed a way to end the ritual on turn 1. None of the AoE spells I had would do it though. Confusing them did nothing, moving them with black hole did nothing either, and while our ice methods could make them slip on ice, the chance of everyone falling was not high enough. I was in real trouble now. How could I possibly stop them all from channeling the ritual without using any damaging spells? After thinking for a while, I remembered that there is still one ability on our air Myrmidon that I had yet to use. It creates a massive silencing storm that hurts all entities inside of it each turn. This had turned out to be way too clunky to use, since my summons normally would just run into it. But in this case, it was perfect. After being silenced, the cultists just stopped channeling the ritual, so with a mere two actions, I was able to end the ritual and after that Orin stood no chance, dying on the second turn. All that was left now was taking the boat over to the Netherbrain. When in the upper city there is no turning back and there is no access to our camp chest here either, so I just had to hope that there were corpses laying about and well, all I can say is I've never been so thankful to see murdered civilians on the street. Since I couldn't bring any of my allies here either without using them in combat, I would have to settle with a shitty level 1 aid scroll, since wizards cannot learn it. Skipping right past the many enemies waiting for us, it is time to take on the Netherbrain. The first step was somehow getting my summons all the way over to the portal without having them get murdered by the big dragon and the mind flayers. I did have one hold monster scroll that I was able to use to freeze the dragon, and with the mind sanctuary I easily had enough damage to kill him even through his 500 HP. Our next objective was to simply open the portal into the brain, and I easily did this by stunning all of the mind flayers and using a globe of invulnerability. Annoyingly, since the emperor had rolled lower initiative than me, this would mean that I only had 4 turns to kill the brain instead of the usual 5. But even worse than that is that apparently summons cannot use the portal at all, so without any other choice I had to leave them all behind and follow the emperor in. Here I was, with a mere 4 turns remaining, and with a very limited amount of actions, I now somehow needed to end the brain without doing any damage myself. I started off by casting my haste spores, and with them was able to resummon the diva using our final level 6 spell slot. It managed to do a fair bit of damage itself, 
and the Emperor used his one high damaging spell. This would not be enough though, as with half health remaining I still needed some very big burst to be able to finish this fight. Here's what I remembered, that the ghoul summoned from Dance Macabre upon death bursts for a huge amount of necrotic damage. So all I had to do was position them away from me next to the braid, alongside the ice methods as they also do the same, and then hit the brain, causing it to kill all the ghouls, slowing them all up for around 100 damage. And with that, I was able to barely finish it off with a mere 4 HP remaining. So yeah, turns out you don't need to attack at all. Simply just letting your minions do it for you is more than enough to finish this game. Thanks for watching guys.